Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Like, Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rollins. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. Mm. You can't be Black media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? September 19, 2022, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Republicans across the country are issuing last-minute challenges to the eligibility of tens of thousands of mostly Democratic voters in key states like Georgia. Organizers hope National Voter Registration Day will encourage voters to check their status and get registered and get unregistered folks to the polls. Wisconsin's Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes wants to be the next United States Senator from that state. He and I talked today about his fight against incumbent Senator Ron Johnson. And we talked about what Democrats need to do to reach black men. The Kansas City, Missouri Police Department is under a Department of Justice investigation in its employment practices and how it deals with racial discrimination. They've been calling for that for quite some time. Now they got it. All right, folks, get this. A black teenager in a Louisiana beauty pageant wears her hair natural, an afro. A white judge writes on her score sheet that she needs to finish her hair. We have the contestant and her parents on today's show. Plus, diversity educator Jane Elliott is back to discuss why white people are so upset about the Little Mermaid being black. In tonight's Fit and Live Win segment, how your health and your vote coincide. And some HBCU folks got a problem because a black woman 
at the University of South Carolina started a dance team. They say she's appropriating blackness. Oh, so y'all want to have an HBCU versus PWI discussion? Y'all sure y'all want this smoke? Because I'm going to give it to you. It's time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah. Yeah. It's on go, 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 y'all. Yeah. Yeah. It's rolling, Martin. Yeah. 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 We are less than 50 days from the midterm elections, and Republicans across the nation are doing their best to suppress the vote in Georgia. More than 65,000 voter registrations have been challenged in several counties. Challenges in Iowa, Michigan, Florida, and Texas prompted the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University and the Campaign Legal Center to warn Georgia officials that canceling any voter registrations this close to the November midterms would be illegal. Tomorrow is National Voter Registration Day. Uh, folks, uh, of course, uh, Holly Hall Holiday, I'm sorry, the president of Sisters Lead is joining me from D.C. to discuss how you can ensure your vote gets counted. Uh, so th this is the thing that we keep seeing over and over and over again, and it happens repeatedly. Okay? All the time. They know the margins. They know what happens. They know full well uh, that 5, 10, 15,000 votes can make a difference, and that is their game plan. They have been doing this, specifically targeting black people, for a very long time. Absolutely. It's, it's not a new playbook. It's not a new strategy. It's an old strategy. It's one that we know well. And I think what that says is that we also know how to combat it. Um, we've been successful in doing so in other, in other cycles, and we have to continue to double down on that. Uh, what I can say uh, that they didn't report about is the vast number of people who are now educated and informed and ready to help to help protect the vote. We are seeing more voter protection efforts, and particularly in states like Georgia, than we have seen in our lifetime. Uh, I was meeting with one group in particular, and they said they're aiming to, reg to uh, recruit more than 1,000 people that will be trained and ready to assist with protecting the vote. And that's just one organization. Um, we have many in Georgia. The infrastructure in Georgia is strong. Um, I'm glad to say that much of that infrastructure is led by black women, and we recognize that voter protection is not just an optional uh, uh, tactic anymore. It is a requirement. We are doubling down on it, and I vary to say that as much as we spend on registering people to vote, we have to spend an equal, if not greater, amount on protecting that vote. Well, and the thing that I have said for a very long time, don't trust these people. Hey, no. there's nothing that keeps you from registering every single year. I mean, I do it in Texas, so it's like, oh, you want to play those games? Gotcha. I'm going to fill out every single year, turn it in. There you go. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we just have to be smart. Uh, we can't let the shenanigans stop us. Listen, there's a reason why they're coming for our vote. What they recognize is that our vote is powerful. Uh, we proved that in uh, 2020 when we had the largest number of people voting in our history. Uh, again, in Georgia specifically in 2021 and the 2021 runoff, we proved it again. People came back out at a special election in unprecedented terms. And they're trying to restrict the way that the vote happens as well as the number of people that vote. And we just cannot fall for it, period. Um, now, obviously, the Supreme Court has made this a lot easier by gutting Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and so, you know, what legal grounds are there to challenge uh, these efforts? 
Well, you laid out one and the Brennan Center seems to be on top of this, and that is the rules that we do have, we have to hold people accountable to. Uh, so we know we are now 50 days out from the election. So really, at this point, these vote purges should be off the table, period. Um, we shouldn't even be having this kind of conversation at this point. And so really holding people accountable to the laws as they exist is going to be critical. I think just as importantly, we've got to continue to arm people with uh, the right level of information about what is what is allowable and what their voting rights really are. Um, this is the way, you know, you want to stop misinformation of the people, make sure they have the correct information. Um, you know, this is a big part of what we're doing as Sisters Lead, Sisters Vote, and as part of the Black Women's Leadership Collective, is making sure that people are not only registered to vote, they're checking their status, but most, and just as importantly, I should say, that they have a plan to actually vote because that's changing too. It is certainly today about the vote purges as we go into National Voter Registration Day tomorrow to help highlight and think about the registration. But it's but we got more stuff to do once we get registered because they're coming for that as well. All right then. Holly Holiday, we surely appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. Uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Bring my panel right now, Dr. Amakongo Davinga, professorial lecturer School of International Service, American University, Renita Shannon. She is a Georgia State Representative. Uh, a. Scott Bolden, a former chair of the National Bar Association Political Action Committee, a lawyer in D.C., Representative Shannon. Again, Georgia, one of those states we've been looking at. I mean, this is the Republican playbook. And this is, this is actual policy of the Republican Party across the country. They want to try to cancel as many votes because they know if you shrink the electorate, they got a bare chance at winning. When you expand the electorate, they lose. That's absolutely right. And I've been on the front lines fighting much of this. Um, bills like this came through my committee in governmental affairs, which I serve on in the House. And to your point, they are changing their playbook to do what they can to suppress people's votes. So first it was allowing governmental agencies to um, target certain voters and challenge um, voter registrations to kick folks off the rolls. And that's what led to a gap big enough that Brian Kemp was able to seat himself as governor um, in 2018, there was a difference of 57,000 votes between he and Stacey Abrams. So what I've watched over time in the General Assembly and fought against has been this movement from having government change these uh, challenge these registrations to having individuals and organizations have the ability to full sale just challenge registrations without any sort of um, reason or, or anything as to why these voter registrations need to be looked at. So, I, but I honestly think that the effect that this is having, um, it's obviously something that we need to fight. But what I am seeing with my constituents and other folks in Georgia, particularly black and brown communities, is that this is making them even more, um, you know, get interested in to making sure that they are able to stay on the rolls and not be kicked off. It's, it's having the effect of making people really do their homework. They shouldn't have to, but it is just making voters really angry. And they are now even more determined to vote. And we are seeing that people are keeping up with what is going on. Again, they shouldn't have to, and we must stop all of this, but it's having the opposite effect. It's almost like they have awakened a sleeping giant. Uh, and uh, I, I keep telling folks, Scott, don't trust any of these folks. Uh, they don't give a damn about black voters. They want to stop us from voting. And the way you penalize them is you vote them out. Well, that's, that's, that's certainly accurate. Um, um, if I can supplement uh, my colleague, the choice word for me is vigilance, right? That sleeping giant is eventually is going to get real smart, that they know they have to be vigilant. They may have fooled us once, but you won't fool us a second time. We're going to make up those 57,000 votes, but we have to be vigilant, not only with the community and then making sure that they're on the voter rolls early and often, but our judicial or our legal organizations that have challenged these laws all around the country in these last minute uh, purging in federal court with some great success in the prior election, as you know well, Roland. And so those organizations have to be vigilant. DOJ can only do so much, but in partnering with those organizations, uh, they can do a lot, but you need bodies, you need lawyers, and you need vigilance. I think we got more than enough on the ground, whether it's the National Bar Association or any other voting rights organization. But now is the time for them to trigger those lawyers and to get into court now versus later and to impress upon the judges that time is of the essence. And uh, if we do that, we got a shot in Georgia, Texas, Ohio, 
uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, and hopefully we can keep the uh, Senate and hopefully we can hold on. I don't think we will, but hold on to the House as well. I'm a Congo. we got to be vigilant. I'm a Congo. I mean, I, I say the exact same thing uh, as Holly. If these people um, want to start to stop you from voting, this is this is how you have to penalize them. Uh, they must lose. They must be defeated. They must, and, and, and not just one race, all of these races, for them to get the message, you keep screaming with the vote, then you're going to pay the cost. Oh, most definitely. And they needed, we need to do it from dog catcher all the way on up. Look, the reason why, look, Biden beat Trump by around 10 million votes or so, and people are still trying to contest that. Now that they're getting people in different positions as relates to these secretaries and states and the like, they are doing everything possible to contest the elections anywhere they see it, from the smallest local one to the biggest state election. And the fact of the matter is, I was just listening to Joe Madison today, and two guys called up. One said he voted for Warnock, and he called to check his registration, and he's not on the roster anymore. Another one called and said that they have him registered as a white man. And so these shenanigans are taking place right now, every single day, at every single moment. And isn't it amazing, Roland, how they say, oh, you can't have a DOJ investigation and do all of this 60 days out, but they won't stop all of this other stuff that's happening on the local level 60 days out, just like the Brennan Center said, as it relates to what should not be happening right before the election. And so people need to realize, once again, if we don't get it now, we're never going to get it. If our vote didn't matter, why are they working so hard to stop us from being able to do it. And I'm glad people are mobilizing right now because it's, 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 it's depressing what they're trying to do. But like you said, Roland, we've been here before, and I don't think they realize that just because historically the other party who's not in power wins when the uh, midterm comes, it, we, sh we should be able to make history this time around because with everything that they're doing from Roe v. Wade to voting rights to all of the racism and the insurrectionist terrorism, there's no reason why history should repeat itself this time around. Uh, indeed. All right, folks, got to go to a break. We come back. Uh, we're going to stay and talk about Georgia. How dumb is Herschel Walker? Even he says, I'm pretty damn dumb. <laughs> but understand what he's doing. He's trying to lower expectations for his debate against Senator Raphael Warnock. We'll break that thing down. Also, uh, a sister at, a U at USC starts a dance team. Some HBCU apps, po blogs posted on, and folks start going off on her saying that, oh, why didn't she just go to HBCU? And how it's accused her of misappropriating blackness. Why does the HBCU PWI conversation sound like light skin versus dark skin? Mm. I got a few things to say. My suggestion, if you one of those folks, you might want to listen to Scarface's No Tears when I'm done. You're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered. Download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Also, join our Bring the Funk fan club. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans uh, contributing at least 50 bucks each. Uh, that's $4.19 a month, 13 cents a day uh, for this show, for Roger Muhammad's two-hour show, and weekly shows from Deborah Owen, Jackie Hood Martin, uh, Greg uh, Card, uh, Stephanie Humphrey, uh, Rolling with Rolling, folks. We got a lot to offer you. It doesn't cost you a dime. We do want you to contribute, though. We have to raise $100,000 each month between now and the end of the year uh, to cover our costs uh, for the year. So please hit us uh, cash, uh, excuse me, check our money orders, P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. We'll be right back. When we invest in ourselves, our glow, our vision, our vibe, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. 
It's an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Bye -bye, When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. Carl Payne pretended to be Roland Martin. Holla! You are watching Roland Martin, and I'm on his show today, and it's, what, huh? You should have some chew cards! Hey, what's up, y'all? It's your boy, Jacob Lattimore, and you're now watching Roland Martin right now. E I get when a politician wants to set low expectations, but if you're Herschel Walker, they are so low, they're literally under the ground. This is what he had to say uh, when talking about uh, the, his expectations for his debate on October 14th in Savannah, Georgia, against Senator Raphael Warnock. So I'm preparing. I'm this country boy. You know, I'm not that smart. And he's that preacher. He's a smart man. Wear these nice suits. So he's going to show up and embarrass me at the debate October the 14th. And I'm just waiting. You know, I show up and I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> okay. Y'all, y'all, that, that was, trust me, that was not an SNL skit. In fact, why don't we play it again? So I'm preparing. I'm this country boy. You know, I'm not that smart. And he's that preacher. He's a smart man. Wear these nice suits. So he's going to show up and embarrass me at the debate October the 14th. And I'm just waiting. You know, I show up and I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do my best. Um, I'm a Congo. <laughs> so... He wears nice suits. He's a preacher. Um, isn't this the same Herschel Walker who lied, who said he finished first in his class? I, but now he a con now I'm a country boy. I'm not too smart. I think he's also the same guy who said something about working for for the FBI in some way, shape, or form. I mean, he's pretty much when he talks. Outside of before the debate, it's like he did everything, and the world just didn't know that he was this incredible man doing all of this work. And then, look, at the end of the day, this is this is disgraceful and despicable, to be quite honest. And like you said, he's working to lower the expectations. And really, at the end of the day, what's sad about this is that he can completely show up and completely underperform, and he automatically has a pass from the Trump base out there who just want to see this ignorant man in office who they can control. And so this is also a reason why he's not going to do any debate prep in any way, shape, or form, because he's already acting as if, oh, I'm just going to get out there and do my best. This man's a former elite athlete talking like that. I mean, this, this is just really disgraceful in every way, shape, or form, but it's more and more reason why people should not be voting for him. And I think, Roland, he's also trying to get people to not actually watch the debate because he realized it's going to be so embarrassing for him. And they're like, well, I'm, he's already my guy. I'm not just going to tune in. So I think that his people around him are pretty shrewd in what they're doing right now and trying to lower these expectations. But he's already telling us what we already knew. Um, Scott, uh, in 2000... He didn't call himself dumb, but George W. Bush basically did the exact same thing against Vice President Al Gore. Bush was the governor of Texas, Gore was vice president. And so essentially, by trying to make it sound like, oh, I'm just, I'm just like not so smart, and this other person just, oh, just brilliant, if he comes in and actually uh, gets his name out correctly, the media goes, wow, that was great. That's what Herschel Walker is doing here. 
He is trying to play the poor me, and then all of a sudden they're going to say, he did better than we thought. That's the game. Well, yeah, but he's playing to his strength because he doesn't, he's not going to be articulate. You can hardly understand him. But, but, but here's the rub, though. You know, a country boy from so-and-so, you lower expectations. You, you I can hear something else. I don't, Somebody talking, Roland. No, I don't know. No, no, lower, I, I, I'm not talking, so go ahead. Okay, I, you lower expectations, but then if you can get in a few rope-a-dope punches, then you're right. The media will say he was a star, if you will. But here's the other part. You know, and Senator Warnock and I have talked about this. Warnock's got to be careful not to make him a victim by being so good and so articulate and hitting so many scoring punches where people wind up feeling sorry because he's so overmatched by Warnock, who's a good Morehouse man and is a preacher, but he's smart and intelligent and, and eloquent. And so Warnock cannot come out and start throwing haymakers because you don't want to create a sympathy vote for his opponent. So he's got to be surgical about it. I think he'd be smart not to take that bait and just surgically cut him up without making him look so overwhelmed that somehow he creates sympathy for his Republican opponent. Hell no. Representative Shannon, damn that. You got to bury no, his. It's no, a no, smart no, debate no. tactic. Okay, here's the whole well, deal. No, 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 Trust me, okay. just, not and just you. you. Disagree with me, and, and you're wrong. And, 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 and you're absolutely you wrong. Because be here's why. You here's can why. Be wrong. No, I'm explaining to you why. See, Scott, here's the difference. You're talking to a jury where <laughs> you're trying to convince them. Here's the reality, Representative Shannon. You ain't got that many, you don't have these undecided Republicans. You got the dumb folk or the GOP, they're gonna vote for Herschel. You got the progressives, the Democrats, gonna vote for Warnock. What you're trying to do, Representative Shannon, you absolutely are trying to talk to those independent voters. You want to show who is better on the issues, who's smarter, who's more brilliant, who has a command of the issues, and if you, if they, if you, be, you do that, you are showing this man has no business representing Georgia in the United States Senate. Representative Shannon? Yeah, so this is terrifying for me because I live in Georgia and, you know, this man could potentially be my senator. So this is this would be entertaining if I did live in Georgia. But because I do, it's more terrifying. I think the thing here that's really dangerous that I think some folks are failing to see is that what he's trying to do is run the same play that, you know, George Bush, as you mentioned, and also Trump, the same play that they did, which was hey, I'm not going to study. I'm not going to know anything about policy. I don't have to come across as a legitimate candidate. And anybody who says anything bad about that, I will just say that those are the elites who are dogging me. And that gens up support for folks that feel sorry for him. And so I'm very worried about this race, very worried about um, people not really paying attention to what he is, what Herschel is saying, and just basically voting for him, chalking it up to it's only people that don't like him. Uh, you got to bury his ass. See, here's the deal. If you try to play footsie, then you're actually playing into his hands. This whole notion of a sympathy vote, look, the right is going to vote for him regardless. You got people like, look, Eric Erickson, this conservative radio talk show host there uh, in, in Atlanta and Georgia, he knows doggone well. They know Herschel Walker is dumb. They know he's illiterate. So you're... Warnock is not going to get any of those votes, okay? They, they are going to vote absolutely. What you got to do, you got to be able to show, this man's so dumb, y'all got to get out and vote for me because you do not want this man making foreign policy decisions and economic decisions. And so when you are that person, yeah, you got to put his ass in a rhetorical body bag. Otherwise, if you dance and go soft, you actually keep him in the match. No, you have to Ro knock his Roland, ass out. You're going for the okie doke, though, Roland. No, what not. about the independents and the moderate? Hold on. What about the independents and the moderate, moderate Republicans? It's going to be a close race. I didn't say you didn't put him in a body, body bag. I just say you gently put him in the body bag as opposed to throwing haymakers. I'm telling you. Well, because he all, needs every vote he can get. First of all, define you a haymaker. Don't have to, no, 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 no. So, no, 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 so first of all, Scott, Scott, you don't Scott, to you're saying, no, Scott, you're saying don't throw a haymaker. Okay, what's a haymaker? 
I'm saying coming out and calling him dumb and making him look stupid on first policy of all, first to of the all, point where Scott, he, he Scott, looks Scott, and Scott, sounds Scott, like Scott, a victim. Stop it. Senator Warnock Who's is not that? Scott. Senator Warnock who's an alpha, is not going to come out and say, Herschel's dumb. You know he's not going to do that. I, I, you're, you're taking me literal. What I'm trying to tell well, you hell yeah, is taking not about what literally. he says. You talking? It's how he says how, it. How should I if, be taking you? If you, take, if, you, if you go very aggressively towards this cat, you're going to make him a victim. But that's not... You can still knock him out. It's just the way you do it. First of all, Listen, aggressive, I say I've aggressive. To about it. For, I've Scott, talked to him about Scott, it, and Scott, his team knows that as well. Scott, first of all, aggressive is not even Warnock style. Anybody paying attention to, the, to this race of McCongo realizes they haven't been running ads against him, uh, dealing with his wife's accusations against him. They exactly, not because they him don't have to. So He's the one, no, himself. Scott, hold on, hold on. So uh, McCongo, the Warnock campaign, that is not going to be their style. But you do have to absolutely show the contrast on who has a command on the issues, who is smarter, who is stronger, and you have to be able to show to an independent voter or somebody out there who's undecided, you do not want that man across from me representing you in the United States Senate. You have to show that you do not carry his ass around the ring for the entire debate. And, and Senator Warnock needs to do that at every opportunity that he gets. If we're talking about these Republicans and these potential independent, moderate voters, they are looking for certainty. They are looking for someone who they feel is going to be intelligent enough to make strong decisions. And we also got to realize that in recent polls, most Americans now, democracy is up there with the economy as it relates to a top threat. They need to know that there's somebody who's going to secure it, somebody who's smart enough who knows the laws when some of these issues are going to be coming up. And Senator Warnock is that man. And like you said, Roland, it's not, it's not his style to even come out there and be completely belligerent, but he has to show that this is not that guy. Like, Herschel Walker, you know, he can be cool in all of these other spaces, but he needs to show a stark contrast because we got to understand, the only reason Herschel Walker is up there anyway is because these guys don't respect black intelligence, so they just feel like they can throw anybody up there to go against any black person, and that's what's happening right now. And so Senator Warnock needs to distinguish himself by just ethering him in every way, shape, or form whenever he gets the opportunity. And that's going to show those independent and moderate voters that this is the guy who we need to keep in the White House as it relates to the man who's going to do the work to help us keep this democracy. Representative Shannon, uh, 1983, uh, a then Congressman Harold Washington was in a debate in Chicago against three candidates. He was against state's attorney, uh, Richard Daley, as well as the incumbent mayor, Jane Byrne. Uh, the view of a lot of white folks in Chicago is that, oh, this was some uh, black dude who did not know what the he was talking about. He went on that debate stage and completely obliterated those two. All of a sudden, white voters went, damn, that dude's smart. That dude's brilliant. He, they, she showed the command of the issues. He completely outclassed Daley and burn. He showed who was the better candidate. There's a reason he beat both in the Democratic primary. What I am saying is if you are representing, if you are Senator Raphael Warnock, you walk on that stage, you don't carry that guy around, you know he's going to say something dumb, and what you simply say is not true. Here's so Herschel, here, here Herschel again. Simply not true. What he just said, False. He does. You you have to show the contrast because if you low, if you lower yourself, you're actually making him look better. No, you have to say yeah, I am a head and shoulders under, above under, this school. So, Representative so, Shannon, go ahead. So, yeah. So what I think this is actually about is not about Warnock having to pander to vote mythical voters that, that don't even really exist, these moderate and independents. Anybody who says they're moderate or independent, tell me the last three or four presidents you voted for, what party, and I can show you what party you mostly align with. I don't think you should pander to those voters. What I am saying is, right now, the Republicans in history, the Republicans do not have a great track record of actually voting for black candidates when they put them up. They allow people like Herman Cain to get up and run for president and fail. They'll let you run, and they'll roll out the red carpet for you if you are a black person, particularly a black man. But their voters don't have a great um, track record of actually supporting those candidates when it comes to the ballot box. What I'm saying is, right now, we're in a situation where I don't think all these white voters who vote Republican are going to support Herschel. But if Warnock comes out yes, and allows... 
use this elite thing. Some of them are, but there, there's still a gap. Some of them, if, if he comes out and allows himself to be painted as elite, that's going to close the racial gap. It's going to bring these voters closer together. So I think what he needs to do, which is I've, what I've said all along, is stay away from, let everyone judge whether or not Herschel is smart, but get him on policy. And like you mentioned, Roland, he needs to point out when Herschel is saying policy that's incorrect and not true. And he also needs to show that he is the person who actually knows the job and has been doing the job. And I think you can do that without adding to some sort of solidarity of, hey, the elites against all of us. Because that's what he did. Here's the whole deal, Scott. Uh, at the end of the day, is this here. They, they're going to vote for him, OK? These, the, the, these are Trump people. And yep. they will follow this fool over a cliff, OK? And here's the deal. This ain't the primary. This ain't that fool Vernon Jones uh, running who got <laughs> obliterated. No, Herschel is the Republican nominee. We already saw when you had Bill Barr after everything he said about Trump in his book and on interviews, said, if Donald Trump got the nomination, would you, would you support him? Barr said yes. McConnell said yes. These people will ride with the R. It don't matter who he is. What I am, what I am suggesting here is, if you, if you are Warnock, I got, I got to bring my A game because I also need to drive my people out by saying, y'all don't want that fool over there voting for y'all in the United States Senate. And I'm just saying, Herschel Walker's team, and I guarantee you, they have already advised him. They are trying, if they want to lower it so low that if he comes out and said, hi, my name is Herschel Walker, and I want to be your U.S. Senate, the, the, the media can say, well, Herschel has said his name right, so he got through the debate. That's their desire. I'm telling you, yeah. that's exactly what happened in 2000 with Governor George W. Bush and Vice President Al Gore. The media fell for this BS, and Bush was horrible. They were like, well, guess what? George wasn't too bad. He got his name right. Yo, Ro, Ro, I don't think, I, we don't really disagree. I'm not saying that Warnock should carry him under any circumstances. I'm saying he should distinguish himself, so we're not that far off. What I, well, all I was pointing out was there's certain risk Right, and if he's aggressive, and 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 Warlock can be aggressive, but he's a smart guy. It's not a style to be belligerent. All I'm saying is, if 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 it if he if it looks like that the the circumstances, whether Warlock controls it or not, that it's an embarrassing debate, you could create with independents and moderate Republicans some type of sympathy where Warlock gets blamed for embarrassing this boy, even though he's just so much better, and he's just right on policy, I, and Herschel's wrong on policy. That was the only point I was raising. I don't think anybody gonna be saying, hey, man, you really beat up on Herschel too bad. I can't vote for you. No, they're going to say uh, that. Moderate they, Republicans they, and independents. They, you ain't get, they don't okay, look like you, you and ain't me. Getting my, he ain't getting Republicans. That's what okay. I'm saying. I didn't say what, no, what I'm saying. What I'm saying is he ain't getting Republican votes. You go in there and say, I am going to show y'all why this fool should not be anywhere near the United States Senate. Uh, that Agreed, but that, you that, cannot be slapping. You cannot be slapping. Yes, you can. See, you, you in that yes, debate, you, can. you going and be slapping. Nope. Yes, you can. Why not cannot be uh, slapping? Yes, you can, because here's the whole deal. Oh, you have you, you have to show he you is can a do danger. that without no. be slapping okay, somebody. Yeah. Well, as somebody, as somebody, as, you, as, as, somebody who, be as somebody who has been in numerous debates, yeah. With, on television, with the public. With people who were of equal value, no, regardless no, no, of what no, you no, thought no, about no, them. No, no, they I, were of equal no, intelligence. I, I've debated some fools, and I destroyed their <laughs> ass, and the audience was like, I'm sure glad Rollo was up there, because that is a damn fool. That's exactly how you do it. I got to go. I'm uh, taking a break. We come back. Uh, we're going to talk uh, more politics. Uh, Wisconsin Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes running for United States Senate. Uh, I will talk with him. We'll also talk to Jane Elliott. Ooh, white folks that lost their mind. The racists are out yelling and screaming because of Little Mermaid and Halle, Berry, uh, Halle Bailey. I done told y'all uh, we're living in the world of white fear. Uh, so Jane Elliott will join us breaking this whole thing down. Also, I got to deal with this whole HBCU PWI thing uh, because uh, it, it's a problem, y'all, and uh, I got to speak to it. And so uh, I'm going to unpack this thing for y'all. And so some of y'all about to get y'all feelings hurt, but deal with it. 
Uh, download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Also, join our Brina Funk fan club, seeing check your money orders to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered, PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered, Zale, Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Rolling at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. We'll be, we'll be right back. When we invest in ourselves, we're investing in what's next for all of us. Growing. Creating. Making moves. That move us all forward. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, are you trying to figure out how to earn more revenue in your business during these volatile times? Learn how to tap into the largest marketplace in the world through government contracting. Our next guest, Akia Hardnett, will be sharing how you can get wealthy through government contracting. We got a young lady, government uh, assistance to government contracts. She literally was um, on government assistance when she came to us and in less than a year, she has been winning um, multiple government contracts and it has changed the trajectory of her family. That's right here, only on Black Star Network. When we invest in ourselves, our glow, our vision, our vibe, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we are about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it. And you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. My name is Charlie Wilson. Hi, I'm Sally Richardson Whitfield. And I'm Dodger Whitfield. Hey everybody, this is your man Fred Hammond, and you're watching Roland Martin, my man, Unfiltered. <laughs> What's up? Uh, so earlier today, I was on Instagram, uh, and I saw uh, a post uh, on one of the HBCU accounts, uh, and uh, it, it caught my eye uh, in terms of what was in the post. And so I, I then read it, and I, I saw the question that was posed. So here's the actual, the original post. So this was on Instagram. Uh, this sister, Princess Lang uh, uh, Zero, she goes, oh, nothing. I created a majorette team at a PWI and performed at our first game. Truly, though, I'm so blessed and can't thank God enough. Thank you to my parents and to everyone who supported me along this long journey. And my girls fired the Cardinal Divas of SCR up next. So the folks at HBCU Pride Nation uh, actually reposted this, and uh, they said, first, let us say we are proud that she took initiative to bring culture to a PWI by creating a majorette team. You did your thing. However, is it us, or does this scream out, I wish I went to a HBCU 
let us know your thoughts. So a, a number of people uh, began to uh, share their thoughts uh, on their page. I was one of those folks. And it was interesting uh, as I was looking at a lot of the comments uh, from people, I was looking at uh, what they were saying, and there were people who uh, some were saying that this is appropriating our culture, and why didn't she just go to an HBCU? And and, they, and this item been been picked up by other blogs as well. Uh, and so what it did is it, it sort of brought back again uh, this whole thing back and forth that people always have uh, when it comes to what well, HBCUs or PWIs. Uh, uh, Dr. Nola Haynes, you've seen her on the show. She's a, a national security expert. Uh, she, uh, of course, uh, teaches at USC. She actually was on Twitter and she saw this going back and forth. And so she was in Montreal, and this is what she tweeted. A few things I'm about to take off, so I won't be able to finish this engaging discussion about HBCUs and PWIs until I land. Also, a fight is brewing on my plane. I really don't want to be part of any TikTok moments, seeing thoughts and prayers. I'm serious. Now, uh, that, that was the tweet that she sent out uh, before, uh, but, but that was one that she actually uh, posted uh, before that. And let me go ahead and pull that one up. This is the one that she that she posted. Uh, she said, the HBCU versus PWI debate gets under my skin. If anyone thinks black folks choose PWIs because it's a lavish life, you are sadly mistaken. You fight every day just to exist. Why go? For e.g., I live in Cali where there are excellent public schools at state cost and no HBCUs. Stop it. It's tired. That's what Dr. Nola Haynes uh, had to say. And as I said, uh, I, I was on the app and I was on, I was on HBCU Pride Nation and I follow a number of different uh, HBCU uh, accounts because of what we do here uh, with this show. And, uh, and there were people who, uh, who, who, who jumped on and uh, they, were, they were upset and some were mad and, uh, and um, you know, um, and, and that kind of stuff like that. And then some people, you know, then went on and on and on. So just here are some of the comments here. Uh, somebody said, I ain't going to lie. I, I'm conflicted. Uh, someone else said, uh, 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 it don't feel right, which is why it's best to keep HBCU culture on HBCU campuses. I'm sure white people at the game were making fun of them or were very irritated by their presence simply because they were happy and black, which is how racism works. Yes, it screams it, but she chose to go to that school, so I support her because she found her piece of heaven there in doing that. Uh, I'm going to give us a slow hand clap for always finding ways to criticize and create separation between us. Excuse me. Go back, please, to the post. Thank you. Uh, and so some other people, uh, somebody said, y'all got to realize not everyone can afford to pick up and move to go to their dream HBCU. There are so many different circumstances as to why she didn't choose an HBCU. And it goes on and on and on. Um, and uh, I love this one here. Majorette teens are big in our culture. I see this as black people being black no matter where they are. Shout out to them for making up space in the ways that feel good and natural to them. Uh, then somebody goes, so what happens when the white girls Columbus this squad? USC isn't an HBCU. She can't have her cake and eat it too. Hmm. Got it. Okay. So let, let, me, just, let me just speak to this just a little bit for the folk out there uh, who don't quite understand uh, what the whole deal is. First of all, let's be real clear. Um, HBCUs did not create dance teams. As one of the folks said, you got dance teams for people who are in elementary school, middle school, mm -hmm. high school. HBCUs did not create black bands. Y'all do know that you've had black high school bands. You've had black folks playing instruments in middle school and in elementary school. So what, what's this whole deal about, oh, somehow you, you are taking HBCU culture because there's a dance team at a football game? Well, let me just give you an example. Uh, at Texas A&M, where I graduated from, we have what's called Yale Leaders. Uh, and they are, in a sense, other schools might have cheerleaders, we call them yell leaders. It's five of them. Historically, they've been white. Historically, they, they, they've been all male. We've, to my knowledge, we've never had a female yell leader. 
Well, our basketball games, yell at this, go there as well. But then they say, you know what? We need something different. So you know what they created at the end of basketball game? A female dance team. Now, Texas a and used to be an all-male institution. Military, ROTC. Historically, again, we had yell leaders, but they created a, da a female dance team at the basketball game. It's been fine. The culture of a and was that, oh, we had yell leaders. But they said, we needed something different for basketball. So they created that. It's been fine. Oh, now, are we supposed to somehow say, who owns the dance team? I don't know, we shouldn't do that. And see, what this also leads to, this leads to this back and forth that goes on. I don't know about you, you know, you went to a PWI. You damn right I did. Three years ago, we were on the Time Journal cruise, and we were all seated around, and uh, we were recording, and Tom said, hey, uh, I bet, uh, I bet uh, you really regret not going to HBCU. I said, absolutely not. I said, I enjoyed my four years at Texas A&M, and if I had to do it again, I'd do it again. See, let me be real clear with y'all. I grew up in a black family, in a black neighborhood, went to black churches, went to a black elementary school, a black middle school, and a black high school. If I didn't know I was black by the time I was 18, then I wouldn't have known. Now, I'm not saying folk go to HBCUs to find their blackness. What I am saying is that my blackness goes wherever the hell I go. So whether my high school was Jack Yates High School, right across the street is Texas Southern University. Right behind us is the University of Houston. Here's the reality. Both schools had School of Communications. Neither, I was the number one student at my high school in School of Communications. Neither one recruited me. So my brother was a freshman at Texas A&M. I, I would be a freshman the following year. My sister followed me. So my parents were gonna have three of us in college at the same time. So I could have easily applied to Northwestern, Syracuse, uh, uh, University of Missouri, top school of, school of journalism. But I said, my parents can't afford that. So it was more economical for me, my brother, and my sister to all be at one college at the same time for my parents. That's why I went. So if somebody wants to question why you didn't, and I heard why you didn't go to HBCU, because I didn't. And them gave me 10 grand. My, my brother had an academic scholarship. I did, so did my sister. My parents never made more than $50,000 combined in their whole life. So guess what? That was an economic decision. But let me also help all the folks out at HBCUs. There are 200 and around, at around 230,000 students that attend HBCUs. Out of the 107 HBCUs, total, it's about 230,000. 15, 20% of that, non-black. There are more than 1.5 million black students at PWIs. So you've got seven times more black students at a PWI than you do at HBCU. And so black people, let's stop the bullshit, if you will, of sitting here questioning somebody's blackness and why you went to a school. Because guess what? And I'll say this here, I bet the HBCUs don't mind the checks that come from non-HBCU graduates. I bet you don't mind folks who write those checks. Some of y'all who's sitting here challenging this sister about, oh, you misappropriating, you taking our culture, y'all didn't mind when Robert Smith stood up there and paid off the debt of the whole graduating class at Morehouse. Guess what? He didn't go to an HBCU. He went to Cornell. Yeah. So this is why this is silly to me. It is utterly silly. And what it is doing, it creates this division. Well, I don't know why you didn't go to HBCU, because it didn't. If a student chooses to go to a PWI, great, that's your call. If they go to an HBCU, great, that's your call. If they go to a community college, great, that's their call. But if you don't know the person's economic circumstance, if you don't know their family circumstance, then shut the hell up. 
Noah said it best. Ain't no HBCUs in California. Yo, Chicago has the third largest concentration of African Americans in America. Do you know how many HBCUs are in Chicago? Zero. Now, you do have a PBI, predominantly black institution, Chicago State, but it's not an HBCU. And so this notion that everybody should go to an HBCU is utterly silly because the numbers simply do not bear that out. What we cannot do is you cannot go to a PWI and then look down on somebody that's an HBCU or you go to a lesser school. And if you go to HBCU, you should be looking down on somebody who went to a PWI by saying, oh, you went to the white school. I even had some fool on Instagram trying to challenge me, man, you always dogging HBCUs. I said, really? That's interesting. I said, because uh, name me the one black media outlet that was at the UNCF conference on higher education. I'll wait. I said, who created the HBCU Giving Day campaign for HBCUs? Who uplifts HBCUs? Who has spoken at 14 out of 18 commencements on HBCU campuses? Me. I said, so who the hell you think you're talking to? We asked the people who were mad at FAMU. Man, roll the dog and I said FAMU. And then my girl Cheryl Smith was a FAMU graduate. She was a newspaper in, uh, in Texas. She had to remind him. She said, hell, he done done more for HBCUs than you have and you went to one. So a lot of people out there really should pipe down and shut the hell up. If this sister at the University of Southern California launched a dance team, more power to her. Great, wonderful. I love it. But I need black folks to stop this BS of pitting HBCUs versus PWIs as if this is a debate. This sounds to me like light skin versus dark skin in Spike Lee school days. And I'm going to get this last one before I go to my panel just to get, give us their thoughts. I remember when we were, we took a road trip when I was at Texas A&M. I saw an alpha chapter, we rolled to a party. And so that was a brother who's also an alpha who had a few words for us and came up to me and was like, you know, y'all didn't pledge for real. You know, I'm, I think he was at Prairie View or TSU, and so he was telling us how we didn't pledge. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. What's your chapter graduation rate? Then he got quiet. I said, in the history of our chapter, only one brother has not graduated, and we don't mess with him. I said, see, your dumb ass talking about who should have got hazed. I said, but we are here to actually make men and graduate. So you tell me what's more important to the culture, black graduates or black folks getting hazed? I said, take your punk ass out my face. Oh, no, he was a fellow fraternity brother, but he was trying that same BS you are alpha at a PWI, but I'm an alpha at an HBCU. I said, that don't mean a damn thing. I said, because full alpha was started at Cornell and then went to Howard. I said, maybe you should check your history. And by the way, for all the folks who keep yelling, who found the most HBCUs? They didn't look like us. So I'm going to need folks to pump their brakes on this nonsense because we, we should not have young folks caught up in this BS over HBCs and PWIs. Go to college, get your degree, support our institutions, even if you didn't go to one. Because I'm, trust me, if you go to an HBCU, you don't mind when a check arrives from a non-HBCU person. Scott, Renita, and Omakongo, uh, mm -hmm. Just uh, weigh in since so uh, Representative Shannon, y'all got a number of HBCUs there uh, in Georgia. I'll let you start. I just think this is just a stupid conversation because, in fact, in yours, how many students go to Georgia State compared to go to the HBCUs in, in your state? Bottom line is, we want our folks in college getting degrees. Period. Well, and you brought up kind of what I thought when I saw this post originally, which is just that, yeah, I understand the complaint. 
because our culture is frequently appropriated and then people don't actually love black people directly. But here's the thing a lot of people don't realize is it can be a privilege to go to an HBCU because a lot of times they are private universities and a lot of times scholarships, state scholarships and Pell Grants and things like that only go to public schools or, or your state may have um, scholarships that are only for state schools. So everybody who's at a PWI is not somebody who just inherently thinks that PWIs are better than HBCUs. It may be that if you were like me, somebody who does not play any sports and has no talent to get recruited and all you have is good grades, you have to go to what you can actually afford. And so for some folks, you know, not having that financial support, whether it be from the state or for different scholarships and things like that, your choice to go to a PWI may be based on where you can get the help to attend. And I think that's what the folks in the comments are missing. It's almost like the, looking at the comments on the post, it, it's almost like these people think that college um, is free everywhere and it's just a, a choice of preference. And that's not it at all. Economics has a lot to do with what college a person ends up at, whether that be community college, mm -hmm. an HBCU, a private university, or a state school. And I'm a Congo, let's be real clear. HBCUs ain't no black oasis. I know <laughs> a lot of people who have Googled, gone to HBCUs, who complained about their experience, any number of things. And so I'm not dissing them. What I'm saying is, just like you might have black students who have issues at PWIs, you got some black students who have issues at HBCUs. So can we just stop this ridiculous nonsense? Well, count me among that list as, as, as a brother who had more... Look, I started my college life at, at Morehouse College, and I ended up transferring to Georgetown. And to be quite honest, in terms of my personal experience, Culturally, I had I had more issues at Morehouse than I did at Georgetown. And that's not, like you said, it's not dissing the school one or the other. It's about my experience and going to what Representative Shannon was saying. Yeah, I, I got more money. I wasn't an athlete. I got more money when I transferred to Georgetown than Morehouse. And don't get me wrong, again, had some great experiences at Morehouse. It's like you said, Roland, it's about whatever is supposed to work for you in that experience that, that you're looking to have. Furthermore, the other reason this is, this is, really important to me is because I actually teach a class at the PWI at American University, a class I created called Cultural Appropriation or Appreciation. Just taught that class today. And when we talk about the definition, I'm going to quote Professor Michelle Hefner Hayes here, who talks about cultural appropriation as taking the external trappings of cultural traditions and using them as decorations on your own history without developing mutually supporting relationships in the community that you're taking from. This is a sister. Whose community is she taking from? It's her own community. Right. And like you said, Roland, you are black wherever you go. So rather than this sister lose herself to conform into whatever she's seeing going down at USC, she's saying, I'm going to bring my culture wherever I go. And she needs to be commended for that. This HBCU PW, I never hated Morehouse or Georgetown or Princeton or the other places. I went to the place that was the best for me. And we all need to go to the places that are best for us with the intention of building a stronger black community no matter where we are. School days was decades ago. Like you said, Roland, it needs to stop. We got bigger issues right now. And Scott, uh, again, so <laughs> I'm a Texas a &M graduate, but I was a scholar in residence at Fisk. Uh, I've, I've literally, I have taken my show, spoken at to at least 65 of the nation's 107 HBCUs. It's a stupid conversation. It really, really is. My sister had four kids, she has four kids. Two went to PWIs, two went to HBCUs. They followed the money. One went to, went to Prairie View, was gonna transfer to A&M. He says, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and stay at Prairie View. That's his choice. We should not be, we should not be pitting black kids against one another, and that's my problem. Well, I agree that it's a stupid debate, so I'm not going to engage in the debate. As someone who has a very black resume, who went to Morehouse College, as well as Howard School of Law, I don't compete against just black lawyers. I compete against everyone at a very high level. But let me share a few statistics with you. As you know, I sit a secretary to the Board of Trustees for Morehouse. The number one reason students who apply to Morehouse and may be accepted, right, but wind up going elsewhere, like Dr. Thomas, is because Morehouse and several other institutions of higher academic learning that are historical black colleges simply don't have the money to provide to compete 
with PWIs. It's just a fact. Secondly, you know, only 10 to 20 percent, depending on the historical black college, only 10 to 20 percent of the graduates actually give back to historical First black all, colleges. That's real, high. that's real high when it's really <laughs> around 5 to 7 percent. Nah, I, well, the most recent statistics I've seen were somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. Spelman College being a little higher. Morehouse, I can't remember, but it was 10 to 15, maybe 15 to 17 percent. But it fluctuates depending on which college you go to. Um, and so it doesn't really make, and I understand the paternity debate and what have you. I never took any of those debates seriously. My two daughters, both, their, their mom and dad were historical black college graduates. They both wound up, my daughter played basketball at UC uh, San Diego, so she turned down Spelman, and her twin sister turned down Spelman and Hampton because she wanted to go to where she could get a music business degree. And so you're absolutely right about that everybody has their choices. People can't afford a whole lot, and you, can't, you may get more money, even if you're not an athlete, at a PWI. So it's really a dumb debate. Dr. Thomas got an offer to go to Morehouse years ago. He's the president of Morehouse now. Really wanted to go. But another PWI gave him more money, and we couldn't afford to get him. And this was 30, what, 30, 40 years ago? And so for all the reasons you said and my colleagues have said on the program, it's really a dumb debate. I mean, I guess if we were drinking and arguing about fraternities and sororities, we could talk a lot of trash to one another. But in the end, it lacks any substance or reality. It oh, really and, does. and last point, there are a lot of HBCUs that are private, and frankly, they're costly. And some people choose to go to the state school because it's cheap. Oh, those oh one more other thing, real quick. One more other thing, you got real 20 quick. seconds. If, if all of those PWI black students you named, black historical colleges, if they all wanted to go to historical black colleges, historical black colleges could not handle that inflow. They don't have the facilities or what it takes to handle that inflow, even if you evenly distribute it amongst the number of historical black colleges, Got even it. in just UNCF. You, we couldn't handle that flow anyway. And, but the bottom line is you want to be able to build the capacity, but at the end of the day, these are the realities. So y'all, cut the yeah. BS, because it's just ridiculous. All right, speaking of the BS, uh, <laughs> when I come back from this quick break, who these white folks are losing their mind because of a black mermaid? Oh my, this sound like Megyn Kelly saying Santa Claus was, Santa Claus was white. <laughs> y'all, it's a mermaid. But I keep telling y'all, white fear in America, that's my book. I keep telling y'all how the brownie of America is making white folks lose their minds. One of the folks who gave me a quote for my book, she's next, Jane Elliott. You know I can't wait to hear what she got to say about this. Jane ain't never been shy. I don't think she gonna be a little shy on this one. You're watching Roller Bart Down Filter on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. Pull up a chair. Take your seat. The Black Tape. With me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. When we invest in ourselves, we're investing in what's next for all of us. Growing. Creating. Making moves that move us all forward. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. How y'all doing? It's your favorite funny girl, Amanda Seals. Hi, I'm Anthony Brown from Anthony Brown and Group Therapy. Uh, Lana Well, and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, Halle Bailey stars in Disney's new movie, Little Mermaid. Uh, and you've seen these videos of uh, young black girls, just uh, awesome. Oh, my, seeing this, uh, this sister as a Little Mermaid. But there's a lot of other people who are not happy. Uh, on the YouTube channel, uh, with the trailer for the, for the movie, uh, there were 1.5 million uh, thumbs down dislikes, but they disabled disabled it, uh, folks. They disabled it, took the comments down and everything. Uh, we have seen uh, this, look at this, uh, 8.1 million views. We've seen all this conversation back and forth, but it's not just Little Mermaid. Uh, what, what's that new show on HBO, the one of them Thrones shows, the one of them, one of, 
Yeah, House of Dragons. I don't watch it. And so, Lord, it's some, it's some, it's some white folks up in arms because, Lord, it's some black characters. And they complain about how you're getting away from what the book was about. I mean, and the crazy thing is, y'all, we're talking fiction. We're talking what's made up and make believe. Well, uh, Jane Elliott has been doing this work four years. She started this the day after Dr. King was assassinated, April 4th, 1968. Uh, and she's been going hard ever since. She joins us, uh, uh, joins us right now. And, and Jane, I, I know, you know, when uh, we have a promo for my book, White Fear, and, and you're quoting there and you were saying, look, this nation is getting more racist. Uh, the bottom line is these people, uh, I f fundamentally believe Trump has unleashed these folks. Uh, they are just uh, angry and upset. And, and this is why I wrote my book. I said how the browning of America is making white folks lose their minds. They cannot handle the fact that now you're seeing black folks and Latinos and Asian folks just showing up. It's no longer as white as right. Everybody else step back. But for the last 400 years, we have misrepresented or underrepresented or not represented people who were other than white. And now people who are white are complaining because there is one fairy tale that talks about that has a black, not black, a dark brown female as the heroine. What, why is that such a big deal? I know what's a big deal. White folks are scared to death. They know that by the year, by, within 30 years, white people, as they call themselves, will have lost their numerical majority in the United States of America. And they're scared to death that people of color are going to want to treat us the way we have treated them. And so they have to, we had a president, well, we call him president, who built a wall, spent millions and millions of dollars to build a wall to keep brown-skinned people out because he said brown-skinned people reproduce too rapidly. Now, what we're dealing with right now is a fallout from that kind of attitude and that kind of statement made by the leader of the United States of America. What do you expect little people to do except say the same kinds of things that he is saying and has said and will say unless we put a stop to this nonsense? Now, what if you, we would If yep. we would stop you using the vocabulary of the 14th and 15th century, if we would stop calling people white because that means purity and goodness, and black because that means savage and evil, if we would start calling people what they are, which is varying shades of brown, we wouldn't have to deal with those two opposites. We have been put on a situation by the, by the Spanish Inquisition, Torquemada and company were going to make everybody Catholic, and they were killing people they thought weren't Christians. Then they realized they'd killed a bunch of Christians, so they had to find another way to decide whether a person was Christian or not, because you couldn't tell by looking at him, and you still can't. But anyway, so he decided they would use skin color. So the lighter-skinned people were called white, which is the color of goodness and purity, and the darker-skinned people were called black, which is the color of savagery and evil. We have been doing that for another 400... That's only 450 years ago, approximately. And we're still doing it. People, it's time to give it up. Let's grow up. You we, said, we are in a young nation, but it's yep. time to grow up. You said something that is on point, and that is... They are afraid that to we're going to do to them what they did to us. Pat Buchanan wrote that more than two decades ago. Mitch Landrieu, in his book, uh, came out a, a, a couple of years ago, he actually said, hey, white people, I've known black people all my life. Trust me, don't be scared. They're not going to do to us what we did to them. But, but you see, they think that, that we believe, when we say the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, that the way white people treat others is the way they want to be treated. I don't think that's the way I want to be treated. I don't believe in the golden rule. I believe in the platinum rule that says do unto others as others would have you do unto them. Treat others the way they want to be treated, not the way you want to be treated. But you see, we're using every possible means we can take to, to enhance, enhance the idea of the rightness of whiteness. And by doing it, we are proving that we are less intelligent, that we are less civil, that we are less socialized than people of color are because people of color know better than to act like this. They know better than to complain because the Little Mermaid isn't their color. They know they have known better than to complain about all those fairy tales that they read all those years and that were pushed on them by teachers all those years. And none of the heroes and none of the heroines to speak of were anything but white. I, I, I had to trip out at, 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 the, at, the, at the, the dragon show. And it, I'm like, y'all, they talking about dragons. <laughs> and this notion, and these people were like, there were no black people during that period. Like, yeah. well, it's dragons. It's a period that didn't exist. <laughs> it's a period in which no, it, it's just ridiculous. It's a fairy tale. 
It makes no sense. And teachers need to say to their children, this is a fairy tale every time they introduce one. But instead, they teach them as though this has really happened, boys and girls. Well, it didn't really happen. It's not going to happen, and they don't have to worry. White people don't have to worry. Yeah, they do have to worry. Because eventually, somebody is going to say to them, do you not realize that only 15 to 18 percent of the population of the Earth is classified as white? Do you not realize that white people, so-called white people, have been in the numerical majority always? Do you not real in the numerical minority always? We have always been in the minority. Why are people all of a sudden catching on to the fact that there aren't as many of us as we thought there were? There aren't as many of us as we thought there were, and it's time to get over it. By the year, within 30 years, white people will be a numerical minority in this country as they are all over the world. Get over it. Haven't you anything better to argue about? Um, there was a, a, if y'all could cue that Bernard Shaw comment up. Uh, I want to play it. I played this when he uh, passed away because we were in Las Vegas in 2007 uh, and he made a comment uh, to the white men in media uh, that I thought was on point. Uh, and, and, and Jane, as I'm, as I'm sitting here, uh, you know, you know, looking at this, you know, we, we are still operating in America, where you still have the first, you know, the first African American, the first woman, the first uh, Latino, the first Asian. Uh, and I was looking at Ron Brownstein's Twitter feed, and uh, where you have these Republican folks who are polled, and uh, they say that racism against white people is just as bad, or even more so bad, discrimination as it is against black people. And and you have the folks like uh, Donald Trump and and Turning Point USA and all these people, and this conservative media machine that's driving this. And I keep telling people, Rupert Murdoch and Lachlan Murdoch, they know it's all BS, but they are feeding this fear of their white viewers, and they're driving in, they're saying, they're coming, they're coming. That's what all this crap is with the migrants and sending folks away. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. When anybody who understands the demographic patterns of any country, you cannot have a future if you do not replace population. Now, ooh, the great replacement theory. Hey, it ain't white people stop having kids. Sorry. <laughs> don't don't ask every white woman who wants to make a, make a living and get an education to have children. They are going to do it. They're going to wait until they're 42, and then it will be too late. And then they'll say, oh, my goodness, well, what, do I, what am I going to do about this situation? Look what society did to me. People, get over it. By the time these young people get ready to have children, they will realize that as the hole in the ozone layer gets larger and larger, more and more sunlight is allowed to enter our environment, and more and more people who have pale faces are going to die of melanoma which is a skin cancer that you get if you don't have enough melanin in your skin. Let me tell you, people of color are going to be very much in demand <laughs> for reproduction in the future. And mark my words, you're laughing now, but you wait 20, 20 years. You won't even have to wait 20 years because they're going to see that if they want their children, their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren to survive, they're going to have to have some melanin in their skin. That's the way it's going to be. This is going to take care of itself. And all these, the silly stuff that you've, go, that you've got going on about the Little Mermaid today is going to fade into the past, and we're all going to just lap ourselves silly over it. That anybody would just would get upset about this is totally ridiculous. Uh, and, it, and it proves the ignorance. It proves the self-imposed ignorance of the so-called white population of the United States of America. And we've got to start, that's another thing, we've got to stop calling this country America and start calling it the United States of America. Because the, the word United is the most important part of that title. And we better start to use it because we had four years of someone who tried to divide us. And this very kind of thing is what happens when you have somebody who is trying to divide people on the basis of the color of their skin. Um, in my book, uh, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds, uh, when I was writing it, the publisher said, well, we were, there were several, several publishers rejected it. And they were like, well, but, but, you know, but I get it, but, but what should be done? And I said, what should be done? I said, is what Jane is doing, is what Tim Wise is doing, is what other, is what other um, white folks are doing. That is having honest, full, in-your-face conversations saying, 
You have got to understand what the truth is, what the reality is. And it must be happening in country clubs, in meetings, places where I'm not at. It must be happening at dinner tables. And so, and, and, and I love those videos uh, that took place in 2020 of these kids basically cussing out their parents who were voting for Trump. And these young, these young white kids, they, they, they were like, mom and dad, you know what the hell you're talking about? Yeah. Because they were challenging them. What they were saying is, you're not going to pass this on to me. Linda Toronto is a journalist, and she said, she talked about the racism of her parents. And uh, she was talking about uh, the, the ring around the tub, and her daughter was taking a bath or something. And, and then she was basically saying, oh, uh, we're white. We don't leave a ring around our tub. That's just those dirty black kids. <laughs> and Linda, she tweeted this. <laughs> Linda said, Linda said, I will not allow my child to go visit with my parents because the, my child is not going to learn their racism. It, that's what has to... We, I say, y'all, this ain't for black folks to solve. This is where <laughs> white folks got to challenge each other and say, no, you're not going to make those comments in front of me and have a belief. We must be a, a constant of challenging of this nonsense, Jane. Well, any, we've all learned to be racist. Anything you learn, you can unlearn. It's time to unlearn our racism. And it's also time to put... Uh, not not the thing that you that everybody is talking about now CRT for me CRT means curriculum respecting truth now who could argue with curriculum that respects the truth when we get to when we start really telling the truth it will change the way children feel about one another and the way teachers feel about the children who come to them as students Panelists, let's see. I'm going to start with uh, the educator first. I'm a Congo. Uh, you get the first question for Jane Elliott. Wow. Uh, it's, it's truly an honor to, to talk to you, Ms. Elliott, for all of just the work that you've done and in inspiring so many of us who do this work in diversity education. I just really want to thank you. Uh, the, the question that I have for you is, could you speak a little bit to the reverse aspect of this? Because I hear people talking about a black person playing a little mermaid, but they've had nothing to say about the over 100 white characters throughout history, actors who have played non-white people like Othello and Genghis Khan and Cleopatra. Could you speak a little bit to that hypocrisy? That, that hypocrisy is what put us where we are today. The absolute, ab, we're absolutely determined as pale faces not to admit the truth and not to see the truth. And mm. when you walk into a room, or as, as happened with me, I was giving a speech at a college in, at a university in Texas. In the middle of my remarks, some teacher, teacher stood up and said, I just look for the person's heart. We deliberately teach people to ignore the largest organ on a person's body, inch by inch, which is their skin, skin in order to think we have to get along with them. This is so mm. ridiculous that we are going to pretend that the Little Mermaid couldn't possibly have been anything but white. And first, it's a, it's a fairy tale, but the first modern human beings that evolved on this earth were not white. Whites came last, and we are going to go first. Make no mistake about this. Long after we so-called white people have died of melanoma or some other <coughs> problem because of the lack of melanin in our skin, all these people of color will still be there, and they'll still be productive, and they'll still be creative, and they'll still be doing wonderful things, just like they were when they, when they managed to populate every landmass on the face of the earth. People of color from countries in Africa at the equator populated, originally populated, every landmass on the face of the earth. Why are we afraid to admit that, and why aren't we teaching that? Why aren't we teaching that this, con this continent, this what we call the United States of America, this continent, was discovered by people of color between, between 200,000, no, 20,000 and 10,000 years before Columbus was a gleam in his father's eye. It's time for us to stop teaching the lie and start teaching the truth. It will make everything easier for everyone. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yes, you did. <sighs> Representative you. Shannon. Okay. Yeah, I just want to say thank you so much, um, Jane, for your work. Um, I worked as a diversity trainer for years, and a lot of the um, training that we used was based off of previous videos you've done. So I know you've been doing this for a long time. This whole controversy is completely ridiculous. Um, you know, that is some of the best singing that you've ever heard in any Little Mermaid movie. And the only thing that I'm mad about is that they showed the trailer now, and we have to wait until the middle of next year to actually see the movie. That's the only crime that I see. But here's my question for you. 
a lot of times when we see white people who are very educated on racial justice issues, when you talk to them, they will tell you that personally their families have discarded them or other white people just sort of chalk them up as to be traitors for talking about uh, standing for racial justice. Do you feel like, has that personally happened to you? And do you feel like um, folks like yourself and uh, others who have done a lot of this work have been able to really make a dent into really educating white folks? Oh, hell yes, it's happened to me. I've been dis I have been discarded by everybody who, who knew me as a child or as a young person. Or at, my mother kicked me out of the family after my father died because she said I have ruined, ruined their reputation of the whole family with that eye color thing. And so that, that I understand that. I understand her anger. And I suppose I should feel sad about that. And I did cry for about five minutes, and then I got over that because my life was much better when I no longer had to go over and babysit my mother. So, yeah, that's one of the things you do. If you, you, know, if you put your head above the parapet, somebody's bound to try to shoot it off. So if you don't want to go into this kind of situation, just keep your mouth shut and go along to get along. And remember that the only thing necessary for the perpetuation of evil is for good people to do nothing. And as long as we continue to do nothing, this situation will continue to fester and boil. But when enough of us stand up and say, no, you're not going to do that in my presence. No, you're not going to tell that black joke in my presence because, number one, you don't know what you're talking. You can tell Irish jokes in my presence if you want to because I'm Irish and I know how strange we are. But you're not allowed to tell, you know, I'm, I'm fussy about the jokes I'll allow in my presence. And many of the things we say are not funny at all to the ones who are on the receiving end of it. And when people say, well, you didn't understand, I say, wait a minute. The way you say it is the problem, not how I take it. Mm. Scott Bolden. Hi, Professor. I, I'm, I'm not only a big fan, I just love you for what you've done and what you stand for. I think the greatest uh, example of white America uh, uh, taking over or projecting an image is through their religion, that Jesus was blue-eyed and blonde-haired when the Bible says that he, the region he was born in, Palestine, or what we believe to be the Middle East now, that his, he was of matted hair and olive skin, and it made sense. Uh, I'd love to get your comment on that. And then secondly, if all of this is true, if none of us are born with a racism gene, we're taught environmentally, right then why is it so hard? Why can't we get a national dialogue on race going where you have those fearless conversations? You now, Rowan talks about his book and, you know, table conversations with family and friends, but, but leadership mandates more than that, doesn't it? That we have this national dialogue. Clinton and Obama just could not get it going and were criticized for it. But um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on those two issues. Well, I don't remember what the two issues were, but I'll tell you how I think about this. Well, what Women was Jesus? Of color. Women, of <laughs> color. Women of color can solve this problem. Women of color can solve this problem. They know what the problem is, and they know how, how it has to be solved. And they're going to come forward, and they're going to take care of it. They're, we aren't going to have a choice as to whether we have a dialogue about this from now on. We're going to have to start telling the truth, because our our... The very, the very survival of this nation depends on our being able to take advantage of all the brilliance that is in those minds of people of color, which we have denied. If you haven't, if your children and your grandchildren, your great grandchildren haven't read the book Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, have you read it? I have not, ma'am, but I will. Get that book and read it this week, and then show it to every one of the younger people that you deal with, because. We have denied and we have refused to acknowledge and recognize and take advantage of all the brilliance that's in, that is in the kind of people who discovered this continent and every other continent on the face of the earth. It's time to start talking about this honestly, but when you try to talk to most white people about racism, the first thing they'll say is, I don't see color. Now, <laughs> I, it's time for people to stop, refuse. Have you had that said to you recently? I don't see color, right? 
Oh, and, and I heard it many times. I, I work oh, in yeah. big oh, corporate yeah. law. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> oh, yeah. And every time every time some fool, pal, melanemic woman says that to me, I say, I, I knew that you didn't see color, because if you saw color, you wouldn't have your hair that color. So I guess you really don't see color. <laughs> and then she gets all upset and angry and says, you don't mean what, you don't know what I'm talking about. I said, oh, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. You don't want to see, a, you don't want to relate to a person unless their skin is the color that you approve of. Madam... Right. There are no white people on this earth. If right. you want to read about what happens to white people, Google Tanzania. Then in Tanzania, there is a large group of albinos. And you'll find out how mm. ugly it is. Yes, have you read, have you Googled Tanzania? Do you know about Tanzania and how albinism is treated there? Because if you don't, you really ought to take a look at that. It will change your attitude where color is concerned in a hurry. People, mm. we are all shades of brown. Get the National Geographic magazine for April of 2018 and read it. Everybody should do that because it's a short, simple description of what's going on in this country, what color is, where it came from, and how very, very valuable, how valuable melanin is. This was, um, I was in the room when this happened. Um, Bernard Shaw got the Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Association of Black Journalists uh, in 2007. And he said this, and this was one of the things where, you know, I wish he had, I wish Bernard, Bernie had said it when he was the chief anchor at CNN on the air to the world. Uh, play it, folks, and then I'll, we'll, we'll uh, get, talk to Jay on the flip side. Wake up. Wake up. Globally, you are an island speck in an ocean of color. The reins of power will weaken, and so will your grip, if you do not faithfully and fulsomely support our nation's greatest strength, diversity. If you do not share, you will lose. Diversity. Diversity is not racial, ethnic, or gender encroachment. Diversity is our national survival. To you caught in the middle, stay vigilant. You must stay strong. You must carry on. If not you, who? To you, starting careers. Embrace risk. Mold change, making it work for you. Better to walk the plank. So, so Jane, I wanted to, you know, what he laid at the, he was specifically talking to white men. Uh, and I remember the faces in the room, they were kind of like, oh my God, did he go there? That was 2007, 15 yeah. years ago when he said that. And when we look today, when we look at the numbers, we look at who still is in control, uh, yeah, there's been some change. Sure, a black woman is president of MSNBC. Uh, sure, a black woman is president of ABC News. Uh, but the reality is, when we talk about who controls the images, uh, newspapers and digital and movies and television. It is still white men, and that's why this battle continues. And what he said there, you got to stay vigilant and keep fighting. The thing that you've been doing, what I've done, what others have done, because that's the only way it changes. We cannot give up. But what he is, what we're saying is white men. These are not white men. These are pale, stale males who will be boys all their lives until somebody teaches them the truth about who they are, what they are, and where we all came from. The first modern human being on this earth was undoubtedly a person of color, and we've got to get over the idea of more than one race. There's only one race on the face of the earth until we give up the idea of several different races. That's how long we're going to have this problem. These aren't racial problems. These are problems of ignorance. You can't change the color of your skin, but you can change the ignorance of your mind. And we could do that. And education could do that. Education should have done that by now. But instead, we are still teaching the same old nonsense. It's time to start teaching the truth. 
The gentleman, the young man who's writing a book on you called me uh, and he interviewed me and um, he said, are Roland, are you surprised that there are not more Jane Elliott's? And I said, no, it's not surprising. I said, because it takes a level of courage uh, to say what needs to be said. And I've said there should be 10,000, 100,000, a million Jane Elliott's and Tim Wise's and others. I said, because that is, that is what it's going to take I said, because you have to confront it head on. That, that, that eye test, we, we, again, when people play, it's, they play those videos, they still go around when you said, how many of y'all in this room would trade places with a black person? And nobody says anything because they know what yep. did Chris Rock say? Ain't a white man in America want to trade places with me and I'm rich because they know that, what that history has been. But you see, there is, there are more, there's more than 10,000 Jane Elliott's. There are a whole lot more black, black women than that. And every woman of color has forgotten more since breakfast than I will ever learn about racism. They have the answer because they know the problem. They know how it feels to be right on the receiving end of it, and they do not want to cause that, that feeling in anyone else. If you, haven't had, if you haven't had that experience, you don't realize how damaging it is. They have had that experience. And they're going to be the ones who lead us out of this mess. Make no mistake about that. They are going to be the ones who lead us out of this mess. Jane, it's always a pleasure. I appreciate you speaking truth. Uh, thank you for always taking our call. Uh, I tell people all the time, one of the, one of the flat out best panels I ever did was you and I hanging at University of Michigan. Uh, <laughs> we could have went on, on and on and on. I felt sorry for the mo mo moderator because she was trying to ask questions. I'm like, just, just let us do what we do. <laughs> We'll listen to you later. We have more to talk about than you. <laughs> Indeed. Jane, you take care. We appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you for calling. Goodbye now. All right, take care. All right, folks. Uh, uh, Jane Elliott there. Fascinating conversation. All right, got to have one coming up next. Again, what we're dealing with, whiteness in America. Black sister, pageant, trying to wear afro. And they're like, oh, your hair's not done. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> it is. We'll talk with her and her parents next. Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Download the app. Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox, Samsung, Smart TV. Also, please join our Bring the Funk fan club. Y'all, ain't no network having these conversations. Not ABC, not NBC, not CBS, not Fox. None of them. Your support matters in allowing us to do what we do. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0. 0196. Cash App, dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell, rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. We'll be right back. When we invest in ourselves, our glow, our vision, our vibe, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. <laughs> When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. What's up, what's up? I'm Dr. Ricky Dillard, the choir master. Hi, I'm Amber Stevens West from The Carmichael Show. Hi, my name is Latoya Luckett, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, 
<laughs> All right, folks, uh, now for a Roland Martin Unfiltered exclusive. So uh, a young black girl in Louisiana is competing in a beauty pageant. A judge says to her, her natural hair is not finished. Yeah, that was actually the comment on this young girl's judging sheet in the Beauregard Parish Queen of Beaufort pageant. Now, here's what she looked like Sunday during the competition, okay? That's what she looks like. Hair looked done to me. Here is what the judge said on the score sheet. Slow down, finish hair, pretty color dress. Talia, her mother, Tierre, and her father, Tyrone Cockburn, join us from Lake Charles, Louisiana. Glad to have all three of you. So, first off, um, how did y'all get a copy of the judge's sheet? Did they make it public to all the contestants? Yes, sir. Yes. Right, they do. They uh, After the competition was over, uh, we were curious as to why, you know, she didn't place, as to why she didn't get anything. Uh, the score sheets were free. Uh, we, it was score sheets, uh, you know, from all three judges. Judge one, judge two, great comments. Judge three, finished hair. So we were, we were just, we were taken aback by that comment. So, so when y'all see this sheet, and y'all see finished hair, I, I'm surely y'all like, I, I know I didn't just read what I just saw. Absolutely. absolutely, absolutely. We was driving when we was reading at the same time, and um, I tell my wife, I said, oh, no, we need to turn around. So she called a direct, she texted the director, and she said, you want to come back? And um, I went up there, and um, she talked to me, and I asked her, can I speak to the judge to find out why, what was the problem with my daughter here? Mm -hmm. And um, she said, I'm the director, and this is as far as it's gonna go. So, um, I mean, I said, what do you mean by that? And then she said, um, I'm sorry, um, the, the, um, the buffet pageant looking for girls with smooth silk hair and not rough hair. Right. So I was kind of like- Whoa, 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 whoa. Is smooth <laughs> silk hair and not rough hair? Yes, yes that's what she told me. Yes, that's in what front, she In front of my daughter, my other daughter and my wife. That's what she told me. Wow. Um, yeah. uh, Talia, was this your first pageant? Had you done other pageants before? Had you ever encountered a problem with your hair? This is actually not the first pageant I've done. I've actually been doing pageants for four years now. Um, before I went natural, I've never had a problem with this particular pageant. I've competed in it three different times. Um, but this year, when I decided to go natural, I didn't get any rewards, any side rewards or anything. So, so you, had, you had done pandas before and you had placed, but when you chose to go natural hair, all of a sudden, winds uh, begin to dry up. Yes, sir. See, this is, this is, First of all, this is what why you have uh, the Crown Act has been passed by different states across the country. This is why uh, the, uh, the House tried to pass it. Republicans uh, actually uh, blocked it, complaining about it. Uh, and, and this is, you know, exactly what we were just talking about the Little Mermaid segment right before. This is what happens when whiteness decides what's favorable, what's good, what, what is deemed as proper hair, proper diction, things along those lines. And so the w white standards uh, are what's, what, what frankly uh, uh, comes first in this country. Absolutely. 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 And, and um, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of comments on lines, mm -hmm. but I just try to keep my daughter, you know, protect her. Um, a lot of people say a lot of stuff. A lot of people say a lot of good stuff, mm -hmm. but the, is the one percent that think we was is was is not racist. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to be racist. We're just trying to get diversity. We're trying to get everybody. Right. Spread so. the awareness. Mm -hmm. Bring awareness to the situation that you know any girl with any type of textured hair should be able to compete in any pageant system and feel comfortable and confident about herself. Uh, now, was Talia the only black girl in the pageant? 
She was the only black girl in her age group, yes. Got it. And of the other black girls who competed, did they have natural hair or did they have pressed <laughs> hair or... They, they didn't. Um, our baby girl, um, 10 years old, she competed. She is natural, but she likes her hair rolled. So she had uh, the big barrel curls and everything. She came in third place. Uh, Talia, obviously, uh, you, you want to compete, uh, but um, with this, um, are you going to change your hair or are you going to leave it as is and say, suck it up? This is how I'm going to roll. I'm going to leave it how it is because I do want to spread awareness about the situation and just to give other girls that push that they may need mm -hmm. to want to start pageants because they see girls that look like them. Uh, questions uh, from our panel. Representative Shannon, you first. I just want to say, Tilly, I hope you know this, but you are beautiful and the judges really missed out. Um, I empathize with your experience. I know the differences between when I wasn't wearing my hair natural to uh, wearing my hair natural and that people do treat you differently. This is definitely a serious issue. As Roland mentioned before, we've got the Crown Act being passed in legislatures across the country um, to make sure that folks are not discriminated because of their hair. It's also happening to black men as well. I've literally worked for companies who told black men they could not have beards. So this is a problem of black people's hair being policed by many different institutions, whether it be the military, corporate uh, jobs, um, now in pageants. I mean, all across the board, this is an issue um, that people do need to take seriously. I guess I, my question for you would be, have you seen any other, what, what kind of support are you getting from the community it, as far as, does your community know that this is an important issue or what are people saying? I've seen so much support. Like, it's honestly shocking how much people actually care, you know? Because you, it, it really gave me a boost of confidence. Um, and, like, the comment itself gave me that boost of confidence to be like, hey, you know what? Embrace your hair even more. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've, I have photo shoots and more patterns to do now mm -hmm. that because of the situation. So uh, that racism backfired uh, against them uh, and folk, uh, uh, not, now your phone is ringing. Exactly. Yes, Good. she's gotten at least uh, four or five offers since this pageant for her to come and compete for free with no entry fee. So she she's definitely got a village behind her for sure. That is awesome. Uh, Omakongo. I, I want to echo what Representative Shannon said. Talia, you are beautiful and you represent us to, to the fullest. I want to know what, what message do you have just to the to the country, we see what you're going through. We see what's happening with The Little Mermaid. At the same time, we see movies like The Woman King coming in at number one, showcasing black women in, in all of the splendor. And a lot of us just feel like y'all should be over it. We're here to stay and we're, we're conquering things. Just what, what do you want to say to the whole country as it relates to people who are still caught up in a lot of this nonsense? Just let people be people and let them express who they are in their own ways without having something negative to say about it. Thank you. Scott. Hey, uh, thank you. I, I don't have a question. I can tell that your parents love you very much, but more importantly, that you love yourself. And that's most important. You can never delegate the power to love yourself to anyone else. You can never let them define you. You define who you are, you lead, you love yourself, you'll go far, and you're going to lead us one day, young lady. I've got three daughters and a granddaughter. I see each of them in you, and the power that you represent, not just for yourself, but in them as well, although they're a little older. So God bless you, and keep loving yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Are you also hopeful that uh, you will inspire other uh, sisters who are in these beauty pageants uh, to wear their hair natural uh, and not succumb to white standards uh, of relaxing and pressing? Yes, I do. I really do. Because even when I do bigger pageants, I still do see some girls who choose to wear their, wear like sew-ins and mm -hmm. stuff. So I just want to be there to represent. All right. Exactly. All right. 
Well, look, uh, you are you indeed are representing. Uh, we did reach out to the Beauregard Parish Queen uh, Beaufair pageant. Uh, they did not respond, did not want to comment. Uh, that is no shock. Uh, and I hope uh, all of the smoke that comes their way, they get all of it. Uh, and, and I would hope uh, other folks uh, who don't look like us would also call them out uh, for the BS and specifically that particular judge uh, for those comments uh, to understand that uh, your hair was finished uh, and, uh, and right. they should be respectful uh, of different uh, standards. And again, we're not living by uh, white standards uh, anymore. We now have a say so in terms of how we wear our hair, how we dress, and the clothes that we wear. Trust me, I had some white folks, even some black people, get mad at me because I wore an African attire on MSNBC, and I told them they can all go to hell. I said, because uh, <laughs> guess what? Nobody gets to tell me what to wear. Uh, and so, and one guy, one brother even was like, well, uh, I, I couldn't hear what you had to say because of what you had on. I said, well, clearly you must be deaf because one has nothing to do with the other. And so even understand there are some self-hating black people out there as well who likely would try to tell you to change your hair in order to bend towards white standards. Uh, so you stay strong and stay committed uh, in what it is that you want to do. Thank you. Yes, All right. thank you. Y'all take care. We appreciate y'all coming on the show. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, folks, again, th this is literally, I, I, I keep telling y'all, I mean, it, when I was talking to my publisher, I said, y'all, we got to publish the book. I said, because white folks are going to keep doing crazy stuff. Uh, this is the embodiment of white fear. This is exactly what it is. So when we talk about how the browning of America is making white folks lose their minds, that's why you got to get the book, because I, I walk you through the history. I keep, I keep trying to explain to people, which I lay it out. At every step in America, or as Jane said, the United States, the United States of America, at every step there's been black success, it's been followed by white backlash. At every step of the way. And so there is this constant assault on what, how we wear our hair, how we talk, how we dress, what we have to say. But here's the crazy thing. Black people drive this country's culture. You got white kids w running around dressed like hip hop stars and uh, they want to sit here and emulate uh, the Beyonce's of the world and LeBron James of the world because they're singing in pop culture. And so what I'm trying to say is we also have to learn how to resist, frankly, colonialism because it still continues. It still continues. I got 120 suits. If I choose to wear a gray suit or a blue suit or a black suit on television, I can. If I choose to wear a dashiki, I can. And I don't give a damn what you have to say. And then somebody told me, well, uh, you're not going to get hired by one of the networks. Well, because I hire my damn self. Because when you own, you're not worried about yes, some, trying to please somebody else. Yes, and unfortunately, that has been the case for a lot of us. We have been caught where we have to change who we are, how we walk, how we talk, how we dress, because somebody else got an attitude. Well, guess what, white folk? We ain't going nowhere. And as Jane said, numbers are changing. We can handle climate change. Just saying. Get your cover of the book, White Fear, How the Brown of America Make White Folks Lose Their Minds. Of course, available on all platforms. Uh, you know it, uh, by Ben Bella Books, Amazon, Indie Books, Books A Million, Target, Barnes & Noble. Uh, also, you can download your copy of the book uh, on uh, Audible as well. Trust me, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, and if you buy the book, post on Instagram, post on uh, Twitter, and I'll be sure to retweet it as well. Uh, coming up next, we'll talk about how voting and the health go hand in hand and fit live win. Yeah, it does. We'll explain. Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches! A real um, revolutionary right now. <laughs> Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. Stay black. I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
I remember being with The View when they said, we want to extend your contract. And I knew God said, it's time to move. It's time to go. And everybody was saying, Cher, you got a great job. You're making all of this money. And I said, no, it's time. And they said, you ain't going to be able to. You've been away from Hollywood. And, it, and I said, it's time to go. And when I did it, right. that's when I realized I was about to go through this divorce. And I was gonna need, it was going to be expensive. It was going to be a lot. And I said, I'm going to stay. I said, I'm going to stay for a couple of years. So you make this money. See, go ahead. I'm going to make this money. And then I'll get out lower. So I'm going to do a compromise. I'm going to do what you say, but I'm going I'm to do it on, on my thing. And he went, really? He went, really. And you know what? Well, really, they said that we were heavy in, in contract negotiations. And they came, my manager called, she said, they're not going to uh, renew your contract. And I went, hey, wait, what? So, what? He, just yesterday, they was offering me more money. She said, they just decided not to renew your contract. And I remember sitting in front of the mirror at the view, and I went, what happened? And it was very clear. God said, I told you it was time to go. by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives, and we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Pull up a chair, take your seat, The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network every week. We'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. We talk about blackness and what happens in black culture. We're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Hey, I'm Amber Stevens West. I'm Avery Sunshine. So this is Roger Bow. I got a message for Roland Mascot. Oh, I'm sorry, Ascot Martin. Buddy, you're supposed to be hooking me up with some of these mascots. I'm sorry, ascots that you claim to wear. Where's mine, buddy? Where's mine? That's all I got to say to you, okay? Yeah. Mascot, goodbye. Hi, this is Essence Atkins, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Election less than 50 days away, and you might say, well, okay, I understand it's a fit, live, win segment. What does the voting have to do with it? But the reality is health equity uh, is on the ballot. When you look at the issues that are being decided, not only on the federal level, but on the state and local level as well. My guest is Dr. Ejo, Ejioma Nodem Opara, a hood medicine physician, partner and physician and assistant professor at Wayne State University School of Medicine. Glad to have you on the show, Doc. Uh, the point that you're making there. Uh, that people do have to understand. We're talking about uh, black women's maternal health. We're talking about breastfeeding. We're talking about cancer. We're talking about research. We're talking about dollars. Or we're even talking about the allocation of green space, uh, the expansion of uh, different things to, uh, for people to be able to fit uh, bike lanes. All of that stuff is tied to fitness, health, and wellness. That's tied to public policy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you, Ronald, for having me on. 
uh, on today. I'm so excited to be here on the show. But you're absolutely right. You know, what we say in medicine, what we're beginning to learn as we are evolving the system of healthcare, medical education, research, practice, and policy, is we understand the, what we call the social determinants of health, impact health outcomes more than the biomedical piece. What do I mean by that? The conditions in which we live and work and play, as well as the structural or systemic drivers that inform those conditions, our housing, education, income, whether or not we're incarcerated, the quality of health care we have access to, whether we live in livable, safe, nurturing neighborhoods, et cetera, et cetera. These conditions impact our health outcomes to a larger extent than genes or, the, or our genetic code or the health care that we uh, claim to deliver in this country. And so what, what are we saying, therefore, is that the prescription for health ultimately is our vote in terms of putting folks in position and then holding them accountable to ensure that those conditions are the best quality so that we can ultimately live our healthiest lives. And this is true in maternal health, as you said. This is true when it comes to breastfeeding and family care. This is true when it comes to mental health. And of course, the litany of physical health conditions that we are contending with today. Um, and and you know, that, that is a great point because, again, we're talking about public policy. Typically, we're talking about for African Americans. We're talking about, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, criminal justice reform. We're talking about education. We're talking about economics. Uh, but the reality is when you look at those health numbers, where we stand, uh, look, we, we're, at the, we're at the bottom uh, when it comes to wellness or when it comes to who's dying the most at the top. And a lot of that is driven, again, by public policy. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I like to say that the health disparities that we contend with, higher rates of hypertension, higher rates of diabetes, higher rates of cardiovascular disease, heart disease, higher rates of cancer, all these ultimately, these disparities, COVID-19, hello, all these disparate health outcomes ultimately are what I call diseases of white supremacy. These are the symptoms of surviving a white supremacy system that has unfairly and in a discriminatory way allocated um, resources to those in white bodies at the expense of those in, that, uh, that are in black and brown bodies. And so what you see is what you get both from surviving the trauma of everyday resisting white supremacy intergenerationally, that continuous trauma response, but also because those resources have not been allocated to us in a fair and equitable way, and so we don't have access to affordable foods and nutritious foods. We have been redlined into neighborhoods that have been chronically disinvested in, et cetera. All of these things show up in the body. And so one of the things we do in hood medicine, in my group, Health Equity Justice in Medicine, HEGEM, in AIM Art, our uh, anti-racism in medicine action round table that is every Saturday, 1 p.m. Eastern time on, um, on YouTube and Twitter, is we talk about how do we connect the dots. That when we talk about public policy, See, all policy is essentially health policy because we wear the consequences of these policies on our bodies. Questions for the panel? Scott, I'll start with you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, doctor. Can good you evening. talk a little bit about the cost of the stress of just being black in America, especially for black men? I mean, I think you've touched on it, uh, you know, kind of in a broader scope, but for someone like me, uh, or someone at any socioeconomic level. The cost of being black and male in America, how does it manifest itself? And what can we do as a group of black men to relieve that stress on a daily basis? I think that's a great question. And thank you so much for asking it. You know, <laughs> the key way that the cost of being a black man in America, again, the cost of surviving white supremacy as a black man in America ultimately shows up in dying before our time. It shows up in our premature death rates. 
I'll give you an example. Here in Detroit, where I sit in the area, we have black folks, specifically led by black men, dying anywhere from five to 15 years earlier than their white counterparts. This is as a result of the weathering effect of, and when we say weathering, the ways in which our bodies are suffer the stress, undue stress of surviving white supremacy systems each and every day and throughout multiple generations. So we have higher rates of illnesses, like we, we talked about, uh, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, uh, et cetera, infectious illnesses, uh, but also from a mental health standpoint, point, undue stress, chronic toxic stress, we like to call it, that then also shows up in higher rates of cancers and other autoimmune illnesses and other many um, illnesses. And so what can we do about it as a people? I think I'll tell you what, we are already doing that. It is the coming together as a community, leaning into the strength that is our blackness and what we call Ubuntu, right? I am because we are. Mm. The strength of community because it does take a village, right? Showing up in spaces as our authentic selves. I love Brother Roland and the way he wears his dashiki and his Ankara and he is who he is in every space. Um, and, and, and being truly, you know, who we are. It is also in allowing for the community to take care of us, right? Making sure we are going to our regular preventive visits with our doctors, making sure that we are uh, creating safe, soft, nurturing spaces for our men to speak their truth with each other without judgment, expectation, or pressure. These are the beginnings of how we can start to take, out, take care of ourselves even while we are actively um, fighting to correct the unjust systems that we are surviving every day. So, so Doc, are you saying I got to wear dashikis like Roland? Because I don't really don't like him in dashikis. Hey, hey, Scott, you ain't got that. <laughs> Scott, Scott, you ain't got that much swagger, Scott. <laughs> Scott, you ain't got that much swagger. She, she, Scott, you got to understand, I can go Here tuxedo, ass, got all dashiki, go. but you a kappa. You ain't got this much swagger. Representative you, you Shannon. That, I bet you put that tuxedo on at the boule, at the grand boule, didn't uh, you? Actually, uh, I took the uh, uh -oh. tie off. We're going right ahead. <laughs> Representative Shannon, yeah. go ahead. What I would, Why do you have to call on first? me? I'm, try, I'm still trying to laugh. <laughs> now I'm you sorry. need to get my question. To the, so is whatever is authentic to you. Whatever is your authentic self, if it's a dashiki, great. If it's a tuxedo, great. If it's a pair of jeans. But the point is showing up as who you are in whatever space you occupy. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So here's Sorry. my question. Um, thank you for your work. Um, I talk a lot. I do a lot of work on reproductive um, justice issues, and a lot mm. of um, what comes into that work is talking to folks about how it's more than health insurance coverage that determines, um, you know, whether or not you'll be able to carry, um, increasing your chances to carry a healthy pregnancy. Talk to folks, the viewers, about how racism directly impacts um, rates of maternal mortality for black women. Absolutely. So we know that black women are placed in a position to die two to three to, in some places like Louisiana, up to four times the rates of their white counterparts during pregnancy, either pre-birth, during birth, after birth. And medical racism plays a direct role in that, in the ways, A, we are not believed when we show up to spaces and make and express our symptoms or our experiences, in the ways that we are, may delay even showing up into these spaces because of concern for, again, not being believed or stigmatized, in the ways that we're treated when we are present there. And again, as Black women carrying multiple, right, weights, of oppression in this country, because not only are we surviving white supremacy, we're also trying to survive patriarchy. And if you also wear the hat of a disability, trying to survive ableism, all these contending stressors um, impact upon our bodies and weigh upon the health of our pregnancies and our babies and the outcomes that we're dealing with. Um, in addition to that, of course, those same social determinants of health, those social conditions that we talked about earlier, also 
impact us, right? And our families and our abilities to work certain jobs that can allow us to have paid family leave so that uh, and child care, affordable child care so we can stay and nurse and breastfeed and take care of our babies and ourselves and our families, right? We are all susceptible because of, again, history and, and years and years of racial and sex, sexist discrimination from being excluded from those kind of jobs that will allow us those resources. So here we get find ourselves on due stress, going back to work way too early, and again, not really uh, being in a position so that we could take care of ourselves while we're worrying about everybody else. And then when we do show up, like I say, we're not being listened to, heard, or believed. Uh, you know, again, uh, Serena Williams enters the chat. We all know that story with her. Maybe she was complaining of chest pain or being concerned with chest pain, right. had to self diagnose her own blood clots in her in her chest, what we call pulmonary embolism, because she wasn't believed. And we have numerous examples of that. And so these are the many ways that really sort of interact to result in these um, disparate uh, outcomes in terms of uh, maternity rate, uh, maternal mortality rate. So let's connect it to voting, right? We know that the maternal omnibus bill is on the ballot, uh, or rather, I should say, is, uh, is out there for, you know, Congress to finally pass into law, and it's still not happened. And what is the maternal omnibus bill is a collection of bills that address everything we've talked about, bills that folks on the ground, grassroots reproductive justice uh, organizations like BMMA, Black Mamas Matters Alliance, and so many folks, Sister Song, so many of Black women alleged folks that have been pushing, right, for addressing maternal mortality health in a, uh, Black mater maternal mortality in a way that is comprehensive and addresses all our concerns. So when we vote people into power, into positions to actually move and make these um, issues into law so that we can address these issues, this is why I say voting is a powerful prescription. Voting is indeed medicine. Voting is yep. indeed care. I'm a Congo. So the question I have for you, Dr. Opara, is how do you connect the issue of voting? We got the midterms coming up now, and we're talking about health particularly as it relates to Roe v. Wade being turned back and particularly how it affects us in the black community more and our, and our sisters and why that should even motivate us to get out and vote more in November, which is how we started the show, talking about the midterms and the elections coming up. Oh, absolutely. I think that's a fantastic question. Um, the overturning of Roe v. Wade uh, through Dubs v. Jackson Women's Health Center is a great example of understanding that our democracy is very fragile, right, and requires hypervigilance. But nobody understands that more than black folks, especially black women, right? We knew way in advance that this was going to happen, that, you know, freedom ain't free, <laughs> or that <laughs> just because we earn freedom doesn't mean that uh, it, it's forever or guaranteed, you got to stay on top of it. And I want to be so just respectful and, and, and thankful and grateful to our black women leaders, particularly now black leaders, period, that we're on top of it and ensure that we were, uh, you know, we were getting things in place in order to, um, you know, protect ourselves from the impact of the overturning of this law. We know that we are placed, again, at higher rates or, or higher risk of negative outcomes as a result of Roe v. Wade and not having access to reproductive health. I often have to remind people that, you know, this is not just about abortion. This is the whole spectrum of reproductive health. This is about prenatal care. This is about birthing care. This is about postnatal care. This is about menopausal care. This affects all of us. Um, in one way, form, or fashion. So we need to be on top of it uh, because this is our issue. So absolutely, this it is on the, in my opinion, the ballot in the midterm. And for us in Michigan, for example, we have um, the, Repro the People's Reproductive Freedom Act that is on the ballot, and we are trying to make sure that this gets passed into law so that reproductive health and reproductive freedom is codified in in our state uh, constitution, as an example. And every state has its own thing, you know, that it's doing. But it needs us to be out there boots on the ground, knocking on doors, bringing our mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters yep. and cousins and neighbors to make sure we are registered and we get to the ballot. Because again, that is health care. Voting is health care. All right. Doc, I certainly appreciate it. Thank you so very much for joining us and breaking that down.
I appreciate you and everybody. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Uh, folks, real quick, uh, we'll tell you the latest. Uh, Roger Golubsky, uh, that white cop in Kansas City, Kansas, uh, who um, was arrested by the FBI on Thursday, uh, has been uh, released. He is on house arrest. Uh, that news uh, just coming down. Uh, and so uh, we have been uh, covering this story here. Like I said, uh, he is on house arrest uh, as a result uh, of being able to uh, make bail being released. And so uh, we'll keep you abreast of what's happening in this case. Also, the Department of Justice announced today that they are investigating uh, the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department uh, for its employment practices. Uh, they've been named in several lawsuits alleging discrimination. In August, KCPD detective sued the department, claiming he was punished for reporting another officer's illegal search. In April, a Kansas City Police Department sergeant sued over a late racial profile during the traffic stop, and then later that month, two black female officers sued the department, alleging discrimination, retaliation, and a hostile work environment. Of course, we were there in Kansas City at, uh, at the invitation of the Kansas City Urban League, uh, and so we look forward to having them on the show tomorrow to talk about uh, this. They've been calling for this, and they got the, the, the DOJ investigation into the Kansas City Police Department. We'll also be reaching out to the mayor of Kansas City uh, to get him on to talk about uh, his department uh, as well. That is it for us. Let me think of Makongo, Representative Shannon, uh, and uh, Scott, who needs to wear a dashiki, but he ain't got no swagger. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Hey, I got the ass Scott on, and I'm looking better than you with the ass Scott. Scott, Scott I'm impressed Scott, with myself. Scott, Scott, you know there's <laughs> nothing you can wear you looking better than me at all. Even, even the beard. You, 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 you can't, you, 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 you can't, you can't. Come on now, come on. Come I on love now. you, bro. No, give me, give me camera seven. See Scott. I love you from see Scott. Mom. See Scott. This. See right here, Scott. See, remember, Alpha's your daddy. Right here. See right here. <laughs> remember, Alpha's your daddy. You can't. I mean, Scott. You, you start wish, wearing that because you, Scott, of you, me. Scott, you wish you had this with swagger. You wish. You. You know you go to sleep. Scott, you wake up. Let's call the women Scott, in your audience. Scott, you wake up. You wake women up. On your Scott, show. you know Let's you wake, wake up. up. Let's go. Scott, you know. Scott, you know you wake up and you say. Damn, I wish I was Roland Martin. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I've never woken up like that. And, and I've Erica, never dreamed about you either. And Erica, what it's worth. And Erica say, damn, I wish you were too. All right, that's how we have to go. All right. I'll see you, you are tomorrow. So outrageous. Yo, I'll be I'll be in Los Angeles tomorrow. I'm flying there for the Sydney Portier documentary being done by Apple Films, Oprah and Reggie Hutland. Uh, that's gonna take place on Wednesday, but I've got to promote the book there as well. So I'll see y'all from LA tomorrow. That's it. Y'all know how we do it. Don't forget, download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. And of course, please, uh, join our Brina Funk fan club. Your dollars make it possible to do what we do. Uh, check in money orders, P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. I'll see y'all tomorrow from L.A. Ha!